<laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mac and Chat. My guest tonight proved in spades that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I'm sure most housewives of a certain age and teenagers will never forget the day that my guest star tonight uttered the words, I set a curse on you, Barnabas Collins. You will never rest, and you'll never be able to love anyone, for whoever loves you will die. Long before Susan Lucci and Joan Collins, there was Angelique Bouchard, my good friend, Laura Parker. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Mac and Chat. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am so excited to have this guest star with me. I've actually known her since I was 12 years old, and uh, I I'm not 12 anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had the great... It's, it's bizarre and surreal uh, when you're a, an adolescent or a teenager to be watching one of your favorite television shows because you never think in a million years that the person in that little black box one day is going to be one of your very dearest and best friends. And that someone is Laura Parker, who you all know best as Angelique Bouchard Collins on the cult classic gothic soap opera Dark Shadows. So let's bring her in. Hello, Lamar. Hello, how are you? I'm okay. good. I'm good. How are you? Good. Here in California, you're in New York, right? What is the we are we're on the we're on the Upper West Side, and it's actually a beautiful 62 degrees tonight, so it's not too bad. It's very nice here too. It's just starting to get dark. It's oh yeah, we we get that about about 4:30 in the afternoon. It's pitch right. black up. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. I love your Christmas lights behind you. Thank you. We didn't get a crew yet, so I put some lights in my ficus. <laughs> <laughs> that's great but i think it may remain my christmas tree because i can't go out and buy a christmas tree they, they might have germs on them so right. I'll, probably will stay. I'll probably keep my ficus christmas tree this year why not you know i think all there are no rules this year it certainly is not the christmas that we all planned on and no one's coming over to see the tree either so yeah yeah it's tough. How how have you dealt with the whole COVID nineteen thing? How has it been for you? It's, everyone has a different. I have a, a neighbor who's an actress. Okay. And uh, I I think after we've been shut down for about two months, I went down and knocked on her door. Her name's Diane Salinger. Okay. And I just see how she was doing, and she opened the door, and she goes, ah, "Isn't it great? Isn't it wonderful?" <laughs> And that's kind of the way I, it's been for me. You know, I'm so lazy. <laughs> not having to go anywhere, not having to show up. I mean, this is like the first thing I've done in nine months, you know, lots of pressure. Oh, <laughs> well, you I did. Know, you know, I've been able to write. I've been able to, what? Oh, I thought somebody would say something. I've been able to just enjoy being alone in my house and uh, read, doing a lot of reading. I can't believe how fast the days have gone by. Yeah. And um, 
I spent about three months picking out a little puppy dog. I spent about three months um, working on the plans for a little house up on the hill that my husband is building. So, you know, we just kept busy, the two of us. Your husband, Jim, who is a brilliant architect. Yeah, and, you know, and it hasn't been bad. It, it's actually, in a way, peaceful and easy. I mean, I don't, I, I just hope I don't get it. That's, that's, I just get anxious that I, you know, if I go out somewhere and I meet people, I might get it. So yeah. I hope I don't get it. It's, it's frightening. I, I, it's, it's, I never thought we'd be living in times like these and our, um, our GP. So much TV. I mean, I have watched, I have streamed about 10 different series, started with Game of Thrones, which I never watched. Okay. <laughs> then Breaking Bad and then Nashville and then Desperate Housewives. That one just finished Scandal. I thought we would never get through that one. <laughs> we watched maybe sometimes two and three and four, be two in the morning and Jim was like, should we just watch one more? Okay, we'll watch one more. You know, everybody's had this experience, I'm sure. Plus there's been a lot of great TV and the specials have been incredible. Yes. You know, the, the Stephen Sondheim special, just yes. we go all the way through. I'm sure you love that one, yeah. It was wonderful. The Broadway special they did the other night whole election i was glued to the damn tv all day long yeah yeah freaking out over that oh and well you know we were all <laughs> please that, i think that was the best christmas gift we got this year I'm gonna make sure i'm in the frame here yeah best best christmas gift we got yeah it's you know i have so many emotions about what's happened and i i was saying to my friend karen the other night so much anger because RGP is very close with Dr. Fauci. They were at the start of the AIDS epidemic together. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Jeffrey Green. He's he's an amazing. What a wonderful man he is, Dr. Fauci. Oh yes, yeah. And he'll and our doctor says, you know, he's his hero. He's he's his hero. But he said, Peter, you know that that this didn't have to happen. And that's the really sad part. And that's what makes me so angry. It's like, oh, this just didn't have to happen. And it's, that's the really sad part for me. It's, just, it's hard to believe that one individual can have such an effect on history, on the times, on the changes on what it actually happens. I mean, something like over a hundred environmental protections have been taken away, which of course everybody knows that's dear to my heart. You know protecting the animals and the forest. Of course. Oh, but we'll get through it. We'll get through it. That's, you know, I feel, I feel, I have a 13 year old grandson who has to go to school every day. Wesley is 13 already. Oh my gosh. Oh my He's a teenager. <laughs> like, oh. But uh, he goes to school every day and sometimes he calls me up I say, aren't you supposed to be in school? And he says, it's Jim. So I said, well, what are you supposed to do? Run around outside? I said, yeah, I'm supposed to be running around outside. But I said, what's this? He said, English. But he sits in front of the, the TV and does his schoolwork. I mean, it, it's amazing. Yeah. And I'm so proud of him. So, you know, we will get through it. That's what I keep telling you. You know, you look back on this and you actually miss some things about it. So. Hopefully, I mean, I, I I hope that we can all just look back at this. Well, hopefully, it's a learning lesson. I I I I mean, gosh, if we didn't learn from this, I don't know what else it's going to take. We've learned many things to appreciate. Yeah. yeah. That, that we you know you keep forgetting. Oh, you know, I'm out of toilet paper. Let's just for, oh, we can end. <laughs> that, that's kind of the way it goes all day long every day. But it's hard for you because you guys had a show that was running and then you had to see that shut down. That's terrible. I mean, it must be heartbreaking for you. Well, I mean, and you know, as as a performer. Peter, you must miss it. All that love coming at you. <laughs> it's, you know, I've said this and it's appropriate talking to you, but Audrey McDonald mentioned this once and it stuck in my head. 
performers, but especially live performers, really are, we're human vampires. We feed off of human energy. I mean, that's what keeps us going. And we are extremely undernourished. You know, um, these last, ten, you know, 10 months or so, it's just been to not have that that feedback anymore. And we're doing virtual shows, but it's it's just not the same. You know, you're look, I'm looking, I'm in, we do them in the theater because we're the only people in there. So we can go in and film. But you're staring at an empty audience, and then later you when know, we're we're piping in applause and laugh tracks, and it's just not the same. It's not the same. It's I called Stephen Colbert piped in the laugh tracks. That was pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> it's. Did you see the, I don't know where it was. The symphony orchestra put plants in the seats, and they did the whole performance for an orchestra full of plants. I didn't did see that. that? <laughs> you didn't see that. I did not see. Now I'm going to have to YouTube it and see. It's got to be on YouTube. Really funny, yeah. Now, so you're from originally, you're from Knoxville, Tennessee. Well, I was born there, but I didn't ever live there. Okay. Baby. I grew up in Memphis. Okay, right. And, uh, so I'm really a Southerner. Um, tried very hard to get rid of my Southern accent, but you can hear it creep in every once in a while. And uh, moved away, lived five years in Iowa. I went to school, uh, in Wisconsin and went to school in Iowa, graduate school in Iowa, and then I went to New York. And I'd been there two weeks and I got the part on Dark Shadows. Because you were living, you I know you um, in a piece you had, you were you were living in Whitewater, Wisconsin. I lived in Wisconsin. I had two little boys. Lived on a farm. Um, Winter time sounded fun because uh, you, you talk about you know going in the sleigh and 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 singing jingle bells at the top of your lungs. We had a sleigh and uh, this horse was a quarter horse, so you know a quarter horse is meant to turn if you lay the reins on the side of the neck, it'll turn that way. That's how you turn a quarter horse. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes. Okay. When you put the quarter horse in the sleigh, they have, there are these things called fills that stick out on either side of the quarter horse. But since he was not a trotter, he was a quarter horse, because this fill would lay against his side and you turn that way. So actually the sleigh went like this. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful story. We went out one time and uh, it was snowing so hard. It was so beautiful. So we decided to go across the highway down this beautiful little country road. And we didn't realize that the back of the sleigh sheltered us from the wind. So we were in a kind of little box. And me with the two boys, and we did, we sang jingle bells and then trotted along. And finally, it was getting dark. It's time to go home. So we turned the sleigh around. And then we realized that the snow was coming right at our faces. And we couldn't see, we could hardly even breathe. So we just buried, took the blanket and buried ourselves down underneath the blanket and the horse took us home. He knew exactly where to go. That's and wild. He, he took us down the road, across the highway, into the farm, into the barn, and we got out and his face was completely covered with snow and his eyelashes had little icicles on them. Aww. But a horse will always go back to the barn. <laughs> that's one good thing so we made it home we didn't freeze to death out in the snow you were in luck now you do you remember when you got bitten by the acting bug there was one thing you said in in uh once upon a time that i was 13 years old i'll never forget this and you said something to the effect of I, I wanted to put on pretty dresses and pretend I was a princess. That's why I became an actor. And I, I remember putting the book down and going, me too. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted to put on pretty dresses too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So I thought, oh, okay. Angelique is on the same page as me. <laughs> well, I wanted to be a performer, but as opposed to you, I could not sing. I tried. People say, honey, don't sing. You can't carry it to me, don't sing. We sang together, though. We did sing together <laughs> once. I thought, well, maybe I'll take ballet. And your ballet teacher said, I'm afraid you're in the back row. We're also glad 
we have you in the class, but she's not in the back row because she can't dance. <laughs> so I don't know. I thought I'll be an actress because you don't have to be able to do anything. <laughs> That was my thought when I was nothing. And I did radio dramas and I worked at the uh, little theater in Memphis and every chance I got, I would just go and try out for a play. But I always wanted to play the ingenue. So when I got on the shadows, I thought that I was the ingenue. I've told people many times, you know, I thought that I was the heroine. And Jonathan Frame was playing Barnabas, who was playing the vampire said, you know, you should really stop moping and crying and acting so down in the dumps because you're not the heroine. And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, no, honey, you're the heavy. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a big surprise to me. And he said, you've got the best role. Don't you realize that? There's thousands of entrees, but there's only one villain, and you're the villain. I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I said, well, I don't, I don't know. I've never been jealous in my life. He said, oh, just dig deep. You'll be <laughs> so I started feeling Angelique's jealousy and her, her desire to hurt people who didn't do things her way. And really, the, that's when the role took off. But it worked. It, it worked because I think, Part of what really made the character work, it's almost what happened with Jonathan. I mean, him saying, well, I don't want to play a vampire. How do you play a vampire? There's got to be something more to this character. And I think the audience and obviously the writers picked up on what you were doing and wanting to be the ingenue. And so it gave Angelique more layers rather than just being a witch. You're exactly you right. All of the characters on this soap opera, which I think this is one of the reasons it, did, it was so successful and that it still has a fan following. All the characters had two levels. There was an under level, an understory that created a tension. Yeah. So the vampire was not just an evil, you know. He, he was in pain because he had to go and buy someone. You, had, you, had, you felt sorry for him. And you know how you're... You're always pulling for the loser. If yeah. you, you watched a football game where you didn't really care about the teams, you didn't know very much, and you start pulling for the losers, and then they get ahead, and then you start pulling for these losers. <laughs> 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 it's just so... I mean, I really felt that to play Angelique as a witch would miss the whole interesting element of her character was that she was heartbroken and in love and desperate and not even a very good witch and certainly not a very good lover because she couldn't hold on to her boyfriend. So she, <laughs> she, was, she, was, she, was, she was someone that we pulled for because she felt bad for her. Yeah. And then when she got in there and she stuck pins and dolls and people went, ah! <laughs> that's, that's great. It was great. I'd look at the man act. I, I did that. I did that. I that's one of my favorite, and how many of us, you know, because, right, we're supposed to be good, and we're supposed to, but there's, I'm sure for, for all of us, you know, we'd like to be able to pull out that doll and stick a couple of pins in, in a few, in a few people. It's, it's, it's in all of us, and I think that resonates. Um, it's like when the car behind you on the road honks and then pulls around and shoots ahead of you Hope you crash. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you go off the edge and die a painful death. <laughs> yeah, there's a little Angelique in all of us. There, there, there really is. There really is. I think that's a very good comment. I think you're right. Now, please make an honest man out of me here. Because recently, if you go onto a Dark Shadows fan board, we, we, some of us can duke it out. We, you know, when it comes to, well, I heard this happen and I heard this happened. I adore, as a gay man, I adore Grayson Hall. I mean, she's a patron saint for me, as she is for many, well, gay, bisexual, whatever you want. Kinsey Four over here. <laughs> um, but she was a little terse to you in the beginning, wasn't she? Because she was pushing this other actress for the part. So wasn't she a little on the cool side? 
Apparently, she had another actress she was speaking for the role. Yeah. I don't know who the actress was. And she was a little pissed when I came on the show. And I was very inexperienced. I'd never done a professional television, where she was quite experienced. You know, she, she nominated for an Oscar, or did she win? I think. She, she did not win, but she was nominated, yes. I mean, she did a lot of film, and yeah. she knew what she was doing. Um, and, you know, she intimidated me. She, you know, very, very strong personality is intimidating. Yeah. So I, but we got to be good friends because we both owned a pug, and we wanted to get our pugs together. Thing and Rosie, right? Thing and Rosie, yeah. Yep. And she... She actually came to some of my, my, my first husband, Tom Parker, was an artist. And she was actually interested in that aspect of me. And she uh, came to some of his shows. She, she was something of a supporter. I mean, she had two sides to her personality. Yeah, like most everyone. But so over time, the ice broke. Over time, the ice Broke. Yeah, but it was always hard for me to have to do scenes where I had to boss her around when she was so much stronger than I was. You know, when the director would say, uh, mm, I think you got to push a little harder here. And I don't know, I'm scared of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> There's a scene between the two of you when you're Cassandra. And I think someone has it on a loop on YouTube uh, when she... She, she, you, you come in acting all innocent, and she just walks over to you, and she gives you a whack. And you say you're going to be very sorry that you did that, and she just gives you that steely glance and walks out. And someone pretty much has that on a loop on YouTube. Just that, that. You know, she, she played her scenes with her, your, her face like this. Yeah, those cheekbones. I always wondered why she did that, and then I said. Why do you lift your chin? She's a kitchen light, darling. <laughs> <laughs> she had great cheekbones. She really did. Um, so yeah, so at least we, we cleared that up. I seem to remember, keep me honest on this too. You went to audition for the role and you were all, you made sure your hair was done, the eyelashes were on, and in walks a girl in sweatpants and a skull cap no makeup, and, and, and she looked at you and said, you're shaking. And you said, yes, because I really, I really want to get this part. And she said, well, I, I hope you do. And it was Susan Onspach. That's right. Yeah. She's been walking her dog in the park. She looked wonderful, you know. Windblown tendrils, some little stocking cap. We were in the bathroom, you know, and I actually, she was like, you know, and she did. She said, well, I hope you get it. Aww. She didn't want it. She didn't want to be on a soap opera. <laughs> Whereas I was out of my brain. I was so, I wanted it so badly. Yeah. But, and here's the deal about that. You know, it, and it's fine. I don't know if, it, well, I guess it's changed now. I know at one point people did look down at soap operas, which I've never understood. Um, it's incredibly hard work. I mean, especially we'll work with other young actors and we have a 14, usually a 14 day rehearsal period. And they go, 14, two weeks, that's not enough. I'm like, I have friends that used to do a network soap opera and learn a new script every night. That takes nerves of steel to be able to do that. But it doesn't make you good. <laughs> well, I mean... It makes you facile, you know, it makes you quick. Not well. The, the, okay, true, but but still, I mean, as an actor, you have to be prepared. I mean, if you've ever done a full week rehearsal for a play, you know that about week two, you begin to find levels and subtleties and all kinds of things that you didn't know were there when you first began. And it's one of the wonderful things about doing a whole rehearsal period with the play. Yeah. Is is to reach the point where every second is filled with the light that, you know, that's kind of been discovered in rehearsal. Yeah. Tone. Whereas uh, with Dark Shadows, it was, we just, a lot of times, we, it's amazing we got through it. It really is. 
I mean, sometimes we forget where we are. We forget, people forget their lawns. People, things would fall down. <laughs> the fly, the fly would come into the shots. Our styrofoam gravestones would fall over when we walk through the, you know, bushes. Prop men would fall to the back, and the mics would come down in our shop, and we were just kept going, just kept going. So it was. Um, it was, it was, we got to be quick, yeah. fast, but not really soap. But the other part of the soap opera is you have a character that develops over time. Right. And they write for your character, and they write for the things that you do well, and that which they expect you to be able to pull off. And so that there's a kind of synchronicity that goes with a long run that you would not get in a story. Yeah. Well, you know, but in a different way. And, you know, it, it, they write for your, your, your gifts or your, what would you call them, your special talents. Sure, your attributes. And, and again, what you bring to the role, they start to bring to the character in the writing. Yeah, so that it works for you in that respect. Yeah. Uh, but it is hard to do three rehearsals, uh, go down on the on the set, and you know, block for camera, which is long and tedious because they have to get their shot. We went by the um... address, but lots of times we didn't have we skip the dress and go right to the performance, and they would come and tell you um, right before you did the performance that you had. To speed up or slow down a certain thing or that you had to touch a certain scene. And you not only had to remember your lines, but you had to remember your blocking and you had to see where you had marks. And if you weren't on the mark, which you had a piece of tape on the floor, if you weren't on the mark, you weren't lit because they lit for the mark. So you see the actors walking around and return to your grave. <laughs> <laughs> Or you could see the eyes on the teleprompter. That was another big thing. I'd be doing these long spells. He throws a witch, these long incantations. Right. Usually the fire, candle lights, and things. And, you know, I call on the powers of darkness. I call on the depths of evil. <laughs> Where are you? You know, you see the eyes wander over. You get a teleprompter, which was a moving piece of paper with all of the lines that you had to say, type on this piece of paper, and it moved over these two rolls, and a person moved it. And that person would, I don't know, get in a conversation, and it would go too fast, and you'd look at the teleprompter, and your minds weren't there at all. But Crazy. Yeah. But you got through it, and... and, and the I, girls were better than the guys. The girls pretty much remember their lines. Jonathan Fred had a very hard time. But... And, and and it worked for the character though. It's it's that far away look in his eye, where obviously he was probably so just that was all part of the Barnabas. He was tortured. He was panicked. He was terrified. He was stuck. He didn't know what to do. And it all worked for the vampire. It yeah. all worked for his character. It worked for his his agony and him to go and bite somebody. It played. Very, very well, and I just could not believe it sometimes. Because I'd be in the scene with him and he'd know about his lines. And then I'd watch it the next week, and he was mesmerizing because yes. he was actually in agony. <laughs> he didn't, you know what I'm saying? He didn't have to invent it. He was actually feeling it because even the teleprompter wasn't there. He couldn't remember his lines. He said one time it was doing Richard III and he forgot his lines just because he was doing Henry V. <laughs> <laughs> I can just see it. I can just see all the other actors. <laughs> was he, um, do, do you have fond memories of Jonathan? Do you have, oh, over, you have, I know you said at your audition he really put you at ease. He was so sweet to me, you know. He was a dear, dear man, really. And, and you know, it's interesting. 
Every single actor on Dark Shadows saw the role and saw the opportunity to be in this soap opera differently. Yeah. And there were some who, who, who it, it was sort of beneath it. You know, they wanted, they wanted a, more of a, a Broadway. Or right. Something. And uh, I think this is true of John Carlin. I think it's true of Jonathan. I don't think Jonathan really wanted to be typed for the rest of his life as a vampire. Yeah. He was a Shakespearean actor. So that's what he wanted. He wanted to be Richard III, Henry V, probably Henry V. Well, it's it's in the in that wonderful. If, if, for those of you watching, check out Master of Dark Shadows. It's a wonderful documentary about Dan Curtis, who created the show. It is. Laura's in it. Uh, Marie Wallace. The pretty much the whole gang, um, plus people that were influenced by the show. But I know when it came to a head, I guess Jonathan said, "Well, I have some friends who are saying I really shouldn't get typed as a vampire." And Dan Curtis's response was, "You know what's worse than being typecast? Being an out of work actor." <laughs> yeah. Well, when I left New York to go to California, I thought. Oh, I really expected to become a pretty big movie star. I had very high expectations for myself. And uh, you know, after five or six years, I realized that Angelique was the best part I ever got. I became more grateful for that experience. And that taps into something because it's, it's interesting, Lamar, that um, there are actors who and, and Jonathan was always nice to fans. I mean, he came to the festivals and that, but there are actors who are, become synonymous with a television show or a film or of note, and they I don't want to hear about it. I don't. I was watching an, an old interview with Greer Garson, um, and she said, you know, after about the first two years when she did uh, Mrs. Uh, Miniver and she won the Oscar, and she said people would come up to me on the street, and, and she said I would get a little bit infuriated, and then I thought, you're being such a fool. Most actors, they can do wonderful work their whole lives, but yet they never latch onto something that becomes so beloved by the public and emblazoned, and, and that that's a blessing, and, and to embrace it, not to say, oh, I don't want to hear about that. And I'm pretty sure that's how you feel about Angelique. It doesn't bother you if someone goes, oh my God, it's Angelique. Yeah. I, I, I'm very... I was very fortunate. I was fortunate to get a part that fit my personality to the to the degree that it was memorable for people. Yeah. And also it opened the door to being able to, to you know to write uh, vampire novels. <laughs> We've got we're gonna do a shameless plug here. So Laura has written four Dark Shadows novels, and the first one they're all wonderful. They're all wonderful, but we have Angelique's Descent was the first book because we didn't really know much about Angelique's backstory. Um, what she had gone through before she met Barnabas and as a child and how did she become a witch? And all of those questions are answered in Angelique's Descent. This is actually the first edition of the uh, of the book and we have, I have them all. I have them all. I have to have them all. So, because I'm a completist and a fan geek. That's it. And then we... The Salem Branch is the second book, which actually, very appropriately, it calls back to... And it, they're a continuum of the show. I mean, it pretty much picks up, in a sense, where the show... That's what I love about it, where the show left off. And right. um, Lara just gets the style. We've got also uh, the other one, uh, Wolf... Wolf. Yeah, sorry, my fangs are slipping. <laughs> um, Wolf Moon Rising, which, uh, again... Quentin. Just hold it up a little higher. Oh, we'll hold that up a little higher. The beautiful David Selby. Takes us into uh, Prohibition and Anna Collinwood of those days and a young Elizabeth Collins Stoddard, Co Elizabeth Collins at that point, um, as played by Joan Bennett. And they're wonderful. And then the fourth book, which, of course... I have them all here. This is the advanced reader's copy, so don't go by this artwork here. But it brings, uh, this brings Vicky, Victoria Winters, back to a desolate Collinwood and wondering what has happened to the Collins family. I, I love all the books. Oh, it's the, that one. Okay, that's the, that's the actual published, yeah. But um, I love, I'll tell you, I think I love the fourth one the best. 
Really? In part because, well, I when, when you and I talked about it when it came out originally that so much of Vicky's experience was based on your own experience uh, in, in terms of being, well, I mean, she's in a foundling home, but, you know, being in that horrific kind of uh, boarding school situation. And you drew from that. I was sent to a boarding school when I, when I was in the first, second, third, fourth grades. Because my mother was divorced and she had to work. And I was sent away to a board, horrible boarding school in Connecticut where some horrible things happened to me and I got to put them all in the book. You know? It's and, 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 I realized, and I realized fictional writers use so much of their own life. You know, they, you think they made it all up. Mm, I don't think they made much of it up. I think they draw from their own experiences and they enhance them or they, you know, they create new levels, but they use what they remember from those experiences is the kind of the, force to make the writing emotional yeah and uh, i was just and i'm still writing short stories and so many of my short stories are just based on experiences that i had in my life that it became a story and that's really the the fun thing about writing is you get to kind of relive your own life in your own on your own terms and it's cathartic it certainly is it's it, you, you know in Angelique's descent, I've told many people that I was in, of all places, in Nepal, in Kathmandu, walking down these streets. And uh, I looked up at this window, and there was a little girl in the window. And the guide said, She is the living goddess, and people come and worship her. And she is chosen. They put a lot of girl children in a room with uh, rabid dogs. And the one that is the least scared will be chosen to be the living goddess. This is in Nepal. This is true. And when she becomes, when she gets her period, when she reaches adolescence, they, they get a new one because she has to be young and innocent. And they dress her up in these beautiful clothes and all these jewels. And she's, she sits at the window, this beautiful little girl. Well, I looked up. She was not beautiful. Very overweight. Obviously, they fed her. Till she was fat, and she was sitting there looking down, and she was obviously so bored and so miserable. I never forgot it. I don't know. I started writing Angelique's descent, and I thought maybe I'll just make this go over to Martinique, and maybe I'll just create this other character. So I turned her into this slave goddess. It's yes. so interesting where ideas come from. And I'm, I don't know whether, I'm sure this is true of every author. You just pull them out of your own experience. And then they feed what it is you're trying to write. Yeah. And the whole idea of the slaves being in control, being controlled by the slave owner, by the, the man that owned the sugar plantation, who was also supposedly Angelique's evil father. Right. I don't know, it just all came out into my brain. I, I can't explain it, really. And uh, I think that um, the fans' favorite was the first one. I think it's the most well-accepted book, although it's probably the least well-written. But I don't think they noticed that, you know. Well, the, second, the second one is the best written, and it's my favorite. Salem Ranch is my favorite because I loved going back and doing the research and reading about those trials, those poor gals on trial. I, I, I lived just, there for four and a half years. So you, and you mentioned when you went to, it, it isn't it like the, the, the town has an aura. Yeah. You did a whole book on Salem. Yeah. I, and you, and you wrote the preface for me, which I am very, I am very proud of that. <laughs> me too. But, um, I had, I did, I loved doing the research and I, I just was so intrigued by the idea that she was a witch and she really was a witch. Where yes. All those that were hanged were not witches. Right. They were just old hair they wanted to be rid of. So that fact that she had power, she had to hide. And then I came across the other, what if she flew? You know, what if she could fly? But she had, to, she couldn't do, she couldn't fly. She had to stay on the ground. Everybody saw her in the air, they know she was a witch. 
I don't know. I just love that whole idea that she, you know, that Angelique. And then I became, I became just so enamored with the idea that she was born again. Yeah. It was the same. It was Angelique. So. Squeak, squeak. Does the. Are we okay? Are we good? Yeah. Hang on. There we go. Yeah. We're back to normal. Yeah. New York City internet. <clears throat> um, and I'm bringing it into the... I also felt that in every, all four books, there is an, a level of hypocrisy. Um, of course, the slaves um, were horribly mistreated. And then Salem Ranch, the, the whole witch trials, the... the uh, the ministers were, you know, the kind of hypocrites that we're seeing in the world today. You know, oh, yes. Morality, but secretly practice immorality. And then we got to the 20s, and what a wonderful period that was. And someone just suggested to me, you know, what if, what if uh, you know, Liz had been, I don't know, one of those gals in the 20s. What, what fun that would be. And then I got to the whole program. Prohibition thing and realized that all the wealthy people had all the liquor they wanted, and a tremendous amount of hypocrisy among the prohibition laws. And then, of course, uh, the last one, I started to, to, to take the, the, the gypsies and how the gypsies are looked upon, have always been looked upon and looked down on in the world. And yeah. I, Gypsy idea is a fascinating idea. So I did some research on gypsies, what, what their life was like to, to live as nomads and to be, you know, prejudice and hypocrisy go hand in hand, like there are two levels. And that's always been my theme. That's the theme I'm mostly drawn to, is I like to, I like to write about that because I think it's the thing that angers me most in the world is hypocrisy. We're all supposed to. And there's a lot of it. Yeah. And it's, it's, well, one, I know I was asked when I mentioned that we were going to be doing this interview, this is the only one we don't have an audio version. So are they, are you thinking of doing an audio version of the, of the heiress book? Once everything's safe. You're so funny. Uh, they have not offered it. We'll start a Facebook page. Raise your hand and someone will give you a part, right? Or raise your hand and someone will give you a job. No, it's how it works. Of course I would have done one. But, you know, they had, they probably didn't sell all that well. You know, they didn't sell. They didn't make a good one. With all, with all due reverence here, uh, and for anybody watching, you know, they're doing... And she's reading them beautifully because I, I adore Catherine. But if they can do all of the Marilyn Ross paperbacks, which barely have anything to do with Dark Shadows, <laughs> they certainly, you know, that's... It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Oh, well, it matters to me and a lot of us. That, pardon my language, you know that... Really, the really fun thing about this book yeah. is it's written in the first person. And I think that's why most people like it because first person is so accessible to the reader. Yeah. You don't really have to do the work. They're in the mind of the character from the very first moment. And it's the first time I've written in first person. I don't particularly like it. But it just seemed like to me, and I wanted to kind of mirror Jane Eyre because Jane Eyre was, one, it was the first concept that Dan Griffiths had. With the beginning of Dark Shadows was like the beginning of Jane Eyre. You know, a girl goes to a house and everybody goes, Oh, don't go there, don't go there, you'll be sorry. And, you know, and she is, and everybody was very spooky. And her whole thing with Mr. Watchester, you know, the mysterious man who was, who's terrified her that she grew to love, he grew to love her. I love that story so much, Jane Eyre. Yeah. And I just, I it would, I would, it would just be interesting if I tried to work that in. It's well, the first person, so uh, it's fun. I mean, it's fun to 
you know, I've always written what's called close third, which is third person, but you are inside their brain. Yeah. Uh, you know, I talk about from really experience. But anyhow. <laughs> Well, I, I like too that in every book, in in all of your books, but that we get um, you've cast that you're 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 casting the roles with the actors from the show. I mean, for anybody who knows, and I, I won't say who the character is, but Victoria meets a guy, and uh, I he's she meets him at his office. And he has a stack of Hershey bars. Oh no, that's Thayer David. That's Thayer David. You know, but that's the fun. That's that's. It's a lot of fun for. Oh my God, that's so. It's Thayer. That's that's. You know, it's perfect. It's just I love and that Robert, you do that. Robert has another person. I mean, he's he, he's, he's the evil guy, and I, um, and of course Roger Davis is the hero of the piece that turns out to be the villain. Yes. Oh, it's awesome, really. So silly. It's wonderful. We love it. We love it. And I know I, I was asked this. I know the answer is, I already know the answer. But yes, we do. We all want to, you left us hanging. You left us hanging and we're like, we want to, we want another one. We want to find out what happens to Vicky after they all wake up from the slabs. Hey, tour people, oh, can I write another one? We would. I've proposed another one. Oh my God! Yay! No, no, no! They have not asked me to write one. So they I'm have gonna, to ask me. I'm going to give me the job. I'm actually going to jump in here because we have about uh, a little over 700 people watching us right now, which is amazing. But so yeah, this is my husband, DJ Mac. Just so everybody knows. Hi. Um, so so many people are actually writing saying that they want another book. So I think we should start a, a writing campaign. Is that okay with you, Lamar, if we do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like getting Betty White on Saturday Night Live. Say, come on, you've got to let Laura give us another Dark Shadows novel. Do you, do you guys know Debbie Smith? Yeah. She's a friend of mine. She actually, she, yeah. She, she read all four books and gave me a lot of advice and gave me some ideas she gave me some wonderful ideas she worked for dan for a long time she wrote for touch by an angel she wrote for some big network show she's a friend of mine she came up with an idea which i thought was a great idea which would be to take all the characters and go to the old west and write a western Ooh. a real western not a okay. funny western yeah not a tongue-in-cheek western but a sure. really old-fashioned and angelique of course is in that <laughs> Of course. <laughs> I just want her in a bustle dress with a whole bevy of girls that she looks after. You know? <laughs> but, um, um, I thought it was a great idea. And I took it to my agent and I have another work. So, but I think that they were thinking that there was going to be another Dark Shadows. Well, then there's another Dark Shadows that was proposed with the two sisters. The two daughters yeah. said that they they got a contract from CW. CW. Yeah. And a script was written. But I, I, I think it was turned down. It was, yes, so, they've, they've passed on it. I know Ansel said that, it was at the Halloween reunion you guys did, was that um, Although the CW has passed on it, there is interest at other studios. The idea is not totally dead. And that they're hoping for something that's going to keep more... In See, when I heard CW, Lamar, I cringed a little bit because um, I know, I, you know, uh, the, the idea... And I love Beverly Hills 90210, but the idea of Dark Shadows 90210 kind of scares me a little bit. You know, I, I, I just think it's there's a certain party line that you have to follow with DS. And I, I mean, we won't get into the Johnny Depp and movie because that's a whole other. It's too bad. As wonderful as that movie is, it's too bad that they changed the film. Yeah. So much that they lost the fans. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure they gave many more, but they lost the original things because they changed the feel, the tone, the whole 
scary, mysterious aspect. We made it into a, you know, wink at the audience. We're all on this show, aren't we? Because we're so sophisticated. A whole other kind of thing. It lost the innocence that people love so much. And, and you know what? It could have been a big success. It could have been another Pirates of the Caribbean. You know? It's all the stories. You could have been movie after movie after movie. Whole franchise. Whole franchise. Yeah. And that's what we thought would happen. And the mistake they make, the fatal mistake they make is you have to cater to the fans of the, 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 the who have kept the show alive all these years. Because then your word of mouth is going to be really good. If you, to me, if you start going, oh well, we have to, we have to hit a certain demographic, and I, now you're going, you're treading in, I think, muddy waters. That's just my opinion. No, I just think they thought that it would be cool to do a satire. It would yeah. show how cool they are, and they are cool people. Oh, they're wonderful. Yes. Yeah, and there are some wonderful moments in the movie. Oh my God. And I think that it probably would have worked. But just between you and me, you need a story. You need a really good story with suspense and jeopardy. It passed the audience on the edge of their seat. You need that. Yeah. It's not enough to have the characters uh, show off their, I don't know, costumes. It's and the effects that their faces can break up into a thousand pieces. It's not enough. You need a, you need you need a story, and he, he didn't have a story. I, I, you know, I don't. It seemed like that was that would have been an easy thing to fix. Yeah, well, it was feuding canneries, was which was ridiculous. No, no, who cares about the cannery? No. Yeah. Not. Somebody needed to be in jeopardy that you loved. Yeah. Somebody needed to have a great strong desire. You know, our Barnabas would never have hung from a chandelier like a bat. It's true. It. It's true. It was cute. It was clever. I loved it. But it was not it was not dark shadows as we as we lived and breathed it. The prologue was wonderful. The prologue was great. You know, the whole thing was wonderful. And it was so flattering to think that these incredibly famous, talented people would want to do. And Alice Cooper, oh my god, that was great. And the girls I don't know the girls and the go-go dancers and the pole dancers and they right. created the era. I mean, they did so many wonderful things. You would have, you would not have believed it. We got there the first day, Pilot Studios outside of London, and they had built the harbor, the entire harbor of of with ships in it and boats in it and docks that went and water. The sets were beautiful. The sets were beautiful. I, I was just, and the, the interior of the house, it was gorgeous. Yeah, that stairway and the ballroom and the and the all of the statues that came to life. And, I mean, the money they spent and the artwork. They had paintings of every single scene, not sketches. Paintings. Yeah, we went into the room, and every single scene had this giant. And the portrait gallery that you barely got a glimpse of, that was real. All of those were the talent that was that, that worked on that film. Yeah. It was, it was really, I think, a great tribute to a soap opera. Just a missed opportunity. Well, but it, just to think that they wanted to do it. I mean, yeah. Helena Bonham Carter thought it was pretty funny, too. She was just like, why am I doing this million-dollar movie on that <laughs> Well, and the best part for us is when the door to Collinwood opens, and there, there's you and Jonathan and Catherine and David. We got to see that the morning before it premiered at um, Grumman's because Johnny Depp was making his first appearance on the Ellen DeGeneres show. He had never been on before, and our friends who work for her knew that we were Dark Shadows fans, and they said, well, come and see Johnny promote the show. It's in the afternoon, obviously. We got a call the night before, and they said, you got to be at the studio at 9 o'clock in the morning, and don't ask us why. So we're like, 
all right, we'll be at Warner Brothers at 9 a.m. And they yeah. said, you guys are going to get to see the movie before anybody else does. What, you know, and they, I guess Johnny and Michelle and the Chloe Mertz, who played Carolyn, was, was there. Mm -hmm. And it got to the moment where you guys walk through the door and John and I went, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Everybody was like looking at us, but you know, it was really cool. That whole part of it was cool. It yeah. Was really cool. So it's um, but you know, it didn't it didn't do anything to hurt Dark Shadows. I mean, because now it's on Tubi TV and Pluto and Decades and. It was on Friday night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. What 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 was what's what's been going on? I mean, then there's Dark Shadows TV and Amazon Prime, and it's you know. Do you know what? Here's what I want to ask you. You got to kiss David Selby. You got to kiss David Selby, and you got to bite Joel Crothers. You have no idea how jealous that makes me. <laughs> Was it fun? No. Oh, gosh, you don't understand acting at all, do you? You're not thinking about it. <laughs> because but they're I mean both beautiful, both beautiful, incredibly beautiful men. You're not thinking about that. You're thinking about making the scene work. Okay. All right. Work. I'll buy it. <laughs> Maybe for a fleeting instance. For a fleeting moment. The well, person I kissed the most was Jonathan, and he didn't, you know, he, he didn't really enjoy kissing me because he was gay, but <laughs> I kissed him. <laughs> but, he said, but he said you were the best kisser on the show. Yes, he did. He did say that. He did say you were the best kisser on the show. But uh, yeah, there were so many good looking guys on the show. Uh, da David and Joel and Roger Davis Roger and... Davis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and all of you, I mean, all of the ladies. I mean, Dan knew how to cast. Humbert looked like Errol Flynn. Yes. Humbert was great. I remember him. Now we have tons Carlin of questions. What was that? Very good Johnny Carlin. Oh yeah. I always thought I always thought John Carlin was a very sexy man. I, 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 I thought I thought he exuded a lot of sex appeal. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And we miss him. He well, was always fun at the festivals. Either sometime we'll have a private conversation when 700 and something people aren't watching. Him. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Just us. Just us. Just us. Now, we have tons of questions for you because people have been writing in. Um... So, John, what, what, what do we have first here? Okay, so people are asking if you do not write another DS novel in the sh short term, are you writing now? Do you, do you have a, a project that you're working on? I have, a, I have a dream, which is to publish a book of short stories. Huh? So I've written about 10 short stories. There, it's, I, I don't know whether you know what I'm talking about, but there's supposed to be literary fiction rather than genre. Horror vampire novels are considered genre. They're considered a particular kind of writing that is supposedly easier to do and fulfills the expectations of the reader of romance novels. You know what I'm talking about, right? Not genre. Yes. yes. No, I'm. I. I totally know what you're I'm, talking about. Right. I'm trying to write a literary fiction, which is not genre fiction, which is a different type of writing. It's more. It's considered better, you know, finer, finer, more, and it's uh, it's more difficult to do, more difficult to bring off. But you see, I went to graduate school, and I, and I got a degree in creative writing. So I, I learned about, I learned to read and understand, hopefully 
attempt, literally. But, are, you, uh, are you still teaching? No. I know I'm that was one of your passions. <laughs> what? I know it was one of your passions, teaching. I <laughs> just told me on the mic. <laughs> I get it. Wait, well, you also had some funny stories about about uh, no students. There is no school. No, um, I taught. I taught um, freshman English at Santa Monica City College right. for about six years, which was really rewarding and wonderful fun for me, and I really enjoyed it. I wish that I had done it sooner and longer, but it was very hard to write these books and teach at the same time. Yeah. And teaching English requires, it's a lot of work because you have to read a lot of papers. And, and uh, you have to do preparations for classes that require reading and writing. And it's, it's a hard subject to teach. It takes a lot of time. But I, I really did enjoy it. And uh, I love my students. And I wish they could have done it a lot longer. People go, why don't you teach acting? I go, don't raise your hand and go, I want to teach acting. <laughs> There are thousands of actors that want to teach acting. You can't get a job teaching acting in the hospitals or the colleges. But you can get a job doing remedial English for kids that didn't do that well in English in high school. And now they're in college and they have to be able to write an essay. And they have to know something more about grammar and how to write a paragraph, things like this. So that's what I taught. And I really did enjoy it. And, uh, I, I wish I could have done it a lot longer because I think I was just starting to be good at it when I stopped. I can't seem to get myself in the middle there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I keep pressing the camera buttons. It's all my fault. Um, so we have a, a question from one of your biggest fans who, who we've all got to meet over the years, Krista Nicker. And, and she's bringing up, and I didn't put her up to this, uh, she's bringing up the time that we all got to work together in 2007. And uh, I'm Mrs. Scrooge. And uh, she, she says, Peter, can you convince Laura to do an online reading of Mrs. Scrooge? Well, for those of you who don't know this, I did. I wrote a, a, a modern day version of A Christmas Carol called Mrs. Yeah. Scrooge. And I wrote it especially for Lamar. And it's funny because you were teaching English at the time. In fact, I didn't realize this. You had just finished grading midterms or something, and, and you learned the script on the plane. I mean, we had it was like Dark Shadows. We had a day and a half to rehearse it. I was rehearsing the cast here in New York City, and Laura learned the script on the plane over. She was on 60 pages of 65, interacted with everybody, and we sold out. It was a lot of fun. I got to... Uh, I was I wrote it and directed it, so I was playing the nephew. I was playing Fred, who Mrs. Scrooge had shunned aside. Um, it was great because I got to sing to Laura at one point towards the end, and I'll never forget our last day. We had a matinee and a nighttime, and during the matinee performance, Lamar started to tear up, and we talked in between shows. And I'll never forget this. You said to me. Uh, you, you said, you know, thank you, because I, I really realized during the song that you really did do this for me. And it's true. I did. I wrote it especially for you. Uh, and my Mrs. Scrooge was based on a horrible boss that my husband had in, in, uh, in the world of computers. Unlike Mrs. Scrooge, she never redeemed herself and became good at the end. But um, if, if Lamar would ever do a virtual online reading of Mrs. Scrooge, I would love to do that with her. That's totally up to Lamar. Uh, Thank have, you, Krista. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Deborah Collins, and mm -hmm. uh, she wants to know. You don't have to do this, uh, but we three people have asked it, but Deborah was the last one. Uh, she wants to know if you can do the laugh. Peter's doing it right now. <laughs> this is not Angela. <laughs> <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.
<laughs> there we go. Look at that, guys. You got the Angelique laugh. Yay. It's funny. People used to ask Margaret Hamilton to do that all the time. So it's something you have in common with... Uh, they would say, please do that, do that wicked, delicious laugh of yours. And uh, I know. I was always hoping that I would get a chance to recite the highway. Do you know that poem by Alfred Roy? Because I don't. I know the whole thing. I know the highway in the heart. I know um, the raven by Edgar Allan Poe. I know it in my heart. I, I know these poems I learned when I was a child. And I always thought someday they're going to put me up on stage and I won't have anything to do and I will fight the high women. But there haven't been any more conventions. We're all just a lot for performance, aren't we? Yeah. And of course, there's, there's, no, there's no audience like the audience at the conventions. Oh, God. It is just, it's miraculous. I know I told, I told, I wrote to Nancy Barrett. I said, you come. You get up on that stage, you will have the best time of your whole career because they will love you so much. Yeah. Yep. She came and she told me, you were right, you were right. She's just a, such a wonderful, welcoming audience at the, at the conventions. And I hope we get to have another one. I hope so, too. Have, I really do. I, we had several things planned for this year that we couldn't have because of COVID. So... Maybe we'll have them next year. We plan to have a celebration for the Danny Curtis movie. Uh, we were going to have a memorial for Johnny Carlin. Because um, that was two years ago, you came for the um, the Paley Center event. Because afterwards, you came to see Golden Girls. We were doing Golden Girls, and you and Jim came to see Golden Girls. That was, I think, for the release of the Dan Curtis, or they just around that time for the for the documentary, they did that uh, special event. Um, we we were just in, in in the city for two days. Yeah, and uh, it was kind of a tough year for me health wise, but I'm oh. fine now. Good. So you know, it was it was uh, it was not like a real convention. There was there were a handful of people there, but. It wasn't like you know where we have the thousands and yeah we can drunk and stay up till two in the morning signing autographs and talking to fans. It's great. Yeah, we I, I I know the fans want yeah. Hopefully, once this is all over, you know, I, um, I'm assuming Jim Pearson is still in charge of everything. I hope that he puts something something together. He does other things. He works for. Um, What's the station? The um, education station. Oh, um, PBS? PBS? Yeah. Yeah. He does all of, he does all of those documentaries. The yes. Music documentaries. And he, he's very busy. And uh, it's a hard thing to do, put on a convention. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not. It's a tremendous amount of organization. And people blame you right and left. Why didn't you this? Why didn't you that? Nobody's grateful, you know. Everybody's complaining, and everybody still has a wonderful time, including the actors, because we get to see each other again. You know? Of course, so it's old home week for you guys. It really is, and it, it's silly to call the people who show up fans because they're really friends. They're not fans. Yeah. I mean, my, the, the people that I look forward to seeing every year are some of my best friends. This is definitely one of them. Well, it's, you know, and what's so nice now, too, I remember my first convention, I was 12, it was at the World Trade Center, Vista, and to, to, and I was dressed up as Barnabas, I had my little caped coat on, and my cane, and my, with my ring, which I'm wearing for you tonight, my Barnabas ring, and, but I just remember what it was like the first time getting to see all of you in person, and it, it, you know, kids should be able to have that ex the same experience that I did because it's it's just so cool to be able to meet all of you and and see you on stage. And I was intimidated, you know, that I was going to meet Angelique, and you said. So <laughs> I remember wandering around. After, I I guess 
there was no autograph line. I walked in and you guys yeah. were first, you know, a return to Collinwood skit. Yep. And it was kind of scary. Yes. A lot of gay jokes and it had a lot of other kinds of off color jokes. Yes. And I thought, why aren't I in that? Why have they ever asked me to be in that? That's my first thought. <laughs> because you got such a reaction to me so much. It was so funny. But well, it was fun. It was fun. Yes. And then, so then you said, I said, well, you said you'd ride me apart. And I did. So the, the next year, you sent me the script and I'm in it, right? And then I find out I have to rehearse. <laughs> you call me. You didn't have a. Second free time before even I had to go and rehearse, but I did it for about two years. We did. We the Collins Poor Players. The Collins Poor Players. We did. Um, first time I put you in, it was Golden. It was Golden Shadows, uh -huh. where we had the Golden Girls breaking down in Collins Port, and uh, and then Angelique uh -huh. shows up. Katie got a part too. Katie, Katie was in uh, when we did the Wizard of Oz booth. She, I had her playing you. She was Angelique. I had a wig. <laughs> yes, she had the big blonde wig with the curls. And then we did Bewitched Shadows, which seemed to be so appropriate. And that's when you and I got to sing together. So that was fun. I was in Dora, and there was, and what was great, I'll tell you guys, um, I've got to dig up the tape of that. It's somewhere in a in a box, but. It was fun because in that skit, we had Laura recreate two moments from the show. The first was when she bites Barnabas when, when in that long, flowing white dress, that clip they show a lot. Um, and then I said, you have to do the curse. You have to do the curse. And I had the, the bat on a pole. <laughs> and, but, but it was so funny because you were watching True Blood at the time. And and she, she started to deliver the, the curse, and she said, I said a curse on you, Barnabas Collins. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, is that what I did? Yeah, that's what you did. And you're like, oh, wait, that's true blood, not dark shadows. <laughs> but, but then she went into the whole scene just as she had done it on the show, and the place went nuts. They loved it. So wonderful. They're it's so wonderful, all those people that came. Yeah. And all those people that the show. They're just wonderful, wonderful people. Well, so are you guys, because you, you give so much. Fortunate. And I've never had a bad moment with a single solitary person. Never had one bad moment. That's great. I know. I've never had a disagreeable fan, you know, complain to me. I mean, they talk about hateful things they said. Like, one of the hateful things apparently they said was that when we walked the red carpet when we did the movie. Okay. The John when we walked the red carpet, uh, I made my dress. And one of the hateful things somebody said was, Lars broke, so she had to make her own dress. Oh, no. Oh, I got rid of her, not broke. <laughs> But anyhow, that's the most horrible thing I've ever read. Apparently, horrible things get said, but I've never, I've never read them. So, uh, well, listen. Try being a Dark Shadows fan because that's that's a whole other, you know. Is it? Oh yes, oh yes. That's that's a whole other show. You're you know, Dark. That, but I've I've never experienced it. Yeah, no. Dark Shadows fandom can be like Peyton Place. That's that's what uh, that's that's it's it's a whole other show. We have people. Yes, everybody's got their idiosyncrasies. Yeah. Of course, of course. We have one, another question. Oh yes, question for Laura. Question for Laura. Uh, so we, we, we have, have a to introduce my puppy. Before. Yes, yes. Yeah, we want to see your puppy. You've got to see Laura's puppy. She's beautiful. Tell me when we're about okay. Yeah. What, now, what was the question? Uh, so this will be the last question. The last question. Kids. Okay. Um, can yeah. you do you have any recollections of the kids who used to wait at the stage door? Uh, we have a friend, Bruce Himmelfarb, who not only was one of those kids, 
but he actually got to be one of the kids who was brought onto set and actually see you guys while you were filming. Do you have any recollections of the kids? Oh, of course. Oh, yes. There were all these people sitting outside. the very early time while I was there. Aww. Yes. yes. There she is. Look at the camera. Look at your camera. <laughs> She's beautiful. She's sweet. She's an Australian shepherd. Oh, God. So cute. <laughs> And she's eight weeks old. Eight weeks old. There's eyes. She has Angelique eyes. <laughs> and what's her name for everyone? Her name is Pearl. Pearl. <laughs> her name is Pearl. So pretty. I'm in love. She's beautiful. Say hello. Oh, cross your paws. That's right. The, the little lady. Little lady. This got her. This is... What did you do in COVID? You bought a dog. That's what you did. <laughs> Why not? Why not? And can we get Bear to come over here? Get oh, but we got to see Bear, too. Oh, Bear, yes. I'm going to go full screen. And my daughter was supposed to come back. She wanted to say hello, but I, she she went out somewhere and doesn't come back yet. Oh, well, we miss Katie. Give her give her a big hug my for us. My grandson is 13. He's now a teenager. I know. Tell the audience about you and you and Katie, Peter. Well, I mean, I'm I'm a couple of years older than Katie, but I kind of feel like because for going to the fest, it's almost like we grew, in a sense, grew up together. But Katie, uh, but her, Katie did a project. yeah her graduation project. She did a documentary about me called Becoming Judy, which we still want to do something with that one day. Uh, following me around as what working as Judy Garland, my, my Judy Garland tribute act. So, um, so we got to be very close. There were some poignant moments. She did, you know, she, she did a nice job in a couple of ways. And uh, you did a great thing for her and enabling her to make it because she got a good grade. Got a good grade. Everybody loved it. It was fun. Of you walking up the stairs from the back. Yep. Remember when you go up and you've talked about you've talked about how much Judy meant to you your whole life, and and we saw the the horrible moment when you'd forgotten the falsies and you didn't know where you, what you were going to do. Oh. And, you know, and then that last moment where you're walking up the stairs. Here, Bear, come here, come here, come here, come here. Where's Bear? Oh, hey. hey, Bear. Oh, this is great. So beautiful. So sweet. I, yeah, that, she really came to respect you both, and she had such a good time doing that. We had fun working with her. We had a lot of fun working with her. Yeah. I, I want to... It was a good subject for her to work on, too, so... I'm, I'm glad she got a good grade. That's, you know, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Everyone loved it. Everyone really enjoyed it. You know, it was an insight. It, was a, it opened people's eyes to what, what that kind of thing is like. Yeah. It was really well. She did, she did a beautiful job. She did a beautiful job. I, um, I just want to thank you so much. I mean, we could... We could talk to you for hours. I know, you know, people there again, as I said last night, they were watching you on the Night Stalker and, you know, they wanted to know what, what it was like to turn blue at the end. <laughs> it was hard. They do these things to actresses. They shouldn't do the things they do. I remember when they threw you in the trunk in the China Lake murders. Michael Parks throws you in the car trunk. All bruised. Just uh, you, you be a, my God. In every almost every role you played, you you, you suffer so much. <laughs> I know. Maybe that's what acting is all about. Suffering. I think I think so. I think you're right. I think it, to to a degree. I think you're right. I hope we can do this again sometime. And you know, I love you both, and you know that I would. Help you in any way I could, and I hope this is, this is a big success for you. And I hope you get back on stage. So, oh, and wonderful! It's there for all of us again. Now, 
cruise? We were going to do the Golden Girls cruise, and thank God we didn't, because I believe half the people on that ship wound up with COVID. Yeah, so many got sick. Oh, no. Yeah, it was, it was right, it was the month before yep. COVID really hit. Yep. And we they wanted... Want the last Dark Shadows cruise we did, Jim and I both got terribly sick. I remember that, yeah. That was the sickest I think I've ever been, because... It's like a melting pot, it's like a cauldron of, to cook the germ. That's what a, a cruise ship is like. Yeah. You know, just the elevators and the escalators, everything gets cut by everybody over and over and over and over. And they're it's already... Like they're already talking about new cruises, and I'm like, how can you be talking about new cruises until this thing gets, you know? Well, I don't want to go on another cruise, but yeah. I would love to do more conventions. I'd love to see, and I'd love to see Dark Shadows go back on the other nighttime show. Should because it's got a lot of draw, you know, emotional draw. It's still not really a show like it, you know. It, was based on all the great horror classics. It was, you know, a very, very interesting piece of work, and I'd like to see it happen again. I really would. I don't want to be in it. I'd like to oh, be in it. now you're disappointing us. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do it if they said, come on in and have a recurring role? What did I say when you wrote me and said, will you be in my show? Of course I would do it. I would do it. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Because here's how I look at it. I, I mean, I know they were proposing a sequel series. I remember that the synopsis said, well, it's going to be 40 years after the original show went off the air and David's descendants and... Yeah. 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 Is that, well, that 50 years. Yeah. Okay. So, so I... Now, it's isn't this funny, John? We were at a restaurant called Coogan's a few blocks from here with Marie Wallace. And I'll never forget this. We had finished our, our dinner. Uh, we were going to get ready for dessert. So that gave us permission to turn on our cell phones and check them and see. And literally it came up CW green light script for new dark shadow series. And here we're having dinner with Marie Wallace. And I told Marie and she said, Oh, you know, she said, well, it won't be anything like our show. And I said, let me throw this at you, Marie. I said, my idea is because nostalgia, and they just did an article about how nostalgia has become so important to people. I would, I would rather see a show, if, 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 you're, if they're going to go in, this, in the direction of a reboot, keep it set in the 60s. I'd like to see it set in 1966, I'd like to see Collinwood looking like Collinwood, the old house looking like the old house, and paying homage. You could take those five scripts, if you had great writers, and say, we're going to do this. We're going to give it the edge that Dan Curtis wanted when he did the NBC series, but let's still make it a costume piece. Because I think part of the charm now is, yes, when you guys were doing it, those were the styles. But as you get in the later generations... For me, you know, Marie said, now it's a costume piece within a costume piece because you've got those 60 hairdos and all of that stuff. And with the success of Mrs. Maisel and Mad Men and, and Feud and, and Fosse Verdon, all of these, keep it set in the 60s and maybe do it. Don't take the innocence away from it, but you could maybe have a little more hanky-panky in there if you wanted to. That's just my thought. We have more sex, but the innocence means more than that. We don't have innocence now. Yeah, well, you it's we're true. Very, we're jaded. We're cynical. We're fed up. We don't believe in anything. Really. Yeah. And back then, we believe if you if you can imagine that all you need is love, we did it. We all believe that. That you could walk up to a row of soldiers and put a flower in the muzzle of his gun. And you could conquer hatred with love. Yeah. And that's all you really needed was. And. <laughs> the world was, you know, paradise. Yeah. It changed. And it would be very hard for Dark Shadows to even be successful, I think, in this day and time. But that's what I feel. Okay. I think you're exactly right. 
they should put in the 60s and they should make it uh, you know it would be fascinating to be behind the scenes oh, of course yes yeah. we're playing these yeah. supernatural puppets these magical people these these people who 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 live forever or who live on blood or and then the actors playing it, I think that would make a wonderful story. Sure. And they've done it. It's, it's been done before, but I just think in this particular, but that's just the way I see it. It's a great and idea. His name, uh, Mark Mark Perry. Yes. Signed the last script. I actually wrote to him and said, can, you just, can I just take you to lunch? I just like to tell you what I think made our show work. And he wrote back, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not supposed to share the ideas. I haven't read your books. I haven't read your books. I can't even. That's hard. He couldn't even talk to me because then I could turn around and say, you all know my papers. I don't know something like that. Come on. So maybe he was right. But I just, I, I wanted to just sit down and tell, you know, so there is some, there is a kind of secret that made Dark Shadows work. And I know that secret. I know what it is. But he wasn't interested. That's unfortunate. It's unfortunate for a variety of reasons, and I didn't, I didn't want anything, not anything from him, not credit. I didn't want to write. I didn't want credit for any ideas. I just wanted to talk to him, essentially about tone. It's also with with this stuff, and I've said I've been saying this for a long time. I wish that whether it's Ryan Murphy or uh, Netflix or whoever, all of these books would make wonderful limited series. I would love to see, I, I'm not because you're my friend, but 10 part series of each of these books, you know, Dan Curtis's daughters, if you're listening, I doubt you are, but, um, <laughs> but these would all make wonderful 10 part limited series. Um, I, you know, what do you guys and a half years of stories already. Yeah. And the series itself, lots of great stories. Yeah, wonderful stories, wonderful stories. So if you're looking for a Christmas gift, guys, go, now I, I'm going to, I got to do a plug for you here, Lamar. So the uh, Amazon, right? Amazon.com. Sure. Uh, Barnes and sure. Noble. Yeah, sure. You can or get. They can, go, they can go on my website and order it on uh, do that now and i'll find it so, yeah do, do it through yeah do it through laura's website um lauraparker.com because it's um at least she can personalize it to you or if it's a gift for somebody and the audio version is available uh of of the first three or you can get them on audible or you can get them on audible I don't have anything to do with those, except that I recorded them, but you can get them on audio. And we're going to... The actual record, and then you can also get it from um, Big Finish. Big Finish. Big Finish has them as well. Yeah. And... Right. They they did the first one. So definitely check that out, lauraparker.com. And... Uh, yeah, books and critters I have known Yes, we've got, yes. this was um, your mom's. If anybody wants a great children's book for bedtime reading to kids six to eight, nine years old, this, you would love, the kids would love this book. It's about bugs. It's a book about bugs. It's a lot of fun. It's for children of every age. It's a lot of fun. And that's available on lauraparker.com as well. That is available there as well. Great. So we got that. So we had to do that plug. What's um just as we sign off here? What's what's your message for? Again, I love that you you not fans but friends. What's the message as we're coming into this new year, and it, things are starting to look up? Thank goodness. Just what, any kind of a special message that you'd like to send out there about what we've been through and and but what to look forward to. Just, just look on the good side of things. Life is, life is magical. 
It's wonderful. You don't have to become cynical because we've been through a hard year. Yeah. And we will get through it and we will be better for it. And, you know, every single morning you wake up and you're, you're alive and breathing and the sun is up is something to be thankful for. Yeah. And you can also be thankful that we have a new president. With, um, Yay! Um, but most of all, we should just be thankful for the fact that we have this life and uh, make the most of it. As my, my, my son Rick says, you have a good time, you might as well have fun, you know, you might as well get the most you can out of your life. Exactly. Don't don't give up. And I know it's true of a lot of people who've had a very hard time. I mean, if you've lost your job, God forbid it, lost where you live, can't pay your rent, you know, move in with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, just, <laughs> you know, partner up. Find a way to and uh, tell the government you're both and they'll give you some money. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate that I, I you know, that I, I have a sad pension because not everybody has a sad pension. So, you know, I'm glad that I have some, I have an organization that looked out for me for, because I was an actress. Yeah. But I, I, I do care. I feel I feel I feel bad for I feel bad for kids that are in their early twenties or early thirties that have a lot of dreams and a lot of plans like you and John and things were going good things were you know my daughter was starting a business you know to have to give it all up was was heartbreaking it's heartbreaking yeah. especially when you just got the ball rolling you know you just got to kind of got hold of things yeah but. Life itself has many, 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 you know, many opportunities. There are many dreams. And some of them will come true for all of us, I think, if we just hold on to them. I don't know. I, I'm not really a philosopher. I prefer to speak. I prefer to say what other people say. And, you know, I can't really think of my own. I'm not a preacher, but um, I do think that, you know, spring will come. And when it does, We'll all have another chance to go at it again. Yeah. That vaccination. We'll all get out there and we'll wear the masks and well maybe we will have to wear them. We'll still get a chance to get back and open the restaurants. I mean I've been out to dinner for a long time. This is my years. Us too. So yeah. Um, learn to cook. Can't think of a better time. It's turning me into a vegan of all things. Oh. Avocado. I know. Well, she says it's, make, it's, it's the only way to go because you get healthier if, you, if you're a vegan. Well, you got me hooked on avocados. You realize that. <laughs> what? You, you got me hooked on I That was the first time I ever had an avocado was at your house. Unbelievable. Oh, they're so good for you. Oh, and I now I, I eat them like they're going out of style. But yes, you got me hooked on those. They're they're you know I, I eat them with everything. We really shouldn't eat animals. The animals are so wonderful. We shouldn't. Eat them. It's true, it's true, it's true. But everybody loves the hamburger. I know, I know. I gotta yeah, I gotta get my fix every once in a while. I too. You know, uh, for everybody who's watching, we you, we all love Lamar so much. She's such an important part of the Dark Shadows legacy. Um, again, I'm fortunate enough and we're blessed enough that it, 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 it is fun. To, I, Jonathan Fritz said this in an interview. He said, you know, we all love to name drop. He, even even me, meaning him. And uh, I shy away sometimes from from it. And, it, you, know, you know, John is... Uh, has a disability, so he walks with a cane, a wolf's head cane. So people see that and they go, 
oh my god do you know what that's from and you know now you get you i've gotten to the point where it's like yes you know actually angelique is a good friend of mine um but that's it's really cool it's really cool and you we always say you're like our california mom you've been so good to us and again so giving and we're so blessed to have you in our lives back down there soon so we can oh now see i did it again we have to wait until COVID's over but then we can get together then we can then we can get together we, and we have, and we'll get together online again because we're coming up on it's going to be the 50th anniversary of of Dark Shadows when it went off the air, even though it's never been off the air. That's this April, I think, is the anniversary of and the movie, your your first feature film. Why don't you have four or five of us on at the same time? Yeah, I would love to do that. Good idea. I would love to do that. Absolutely. Roger and Catherine. And we could all just dig it out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there if you're there. We love you so much, Lamar. I want to thank everybody for for tuning in tonight. I hope you had a good time. I just want to say hi, Jim. You're welcome. And of course, hi, Lee. Love you, Lee. Love you, Jimmy. I don't know if they're watching. And hi, Krista. I think they are. Hi, I think hi, little Nick. Alexis. So maybe some other people whose names I would recognize. We'll um we'll we'll definitely have Lamar back and uh, hopefully Yeah, everybody we're getting we're getting there. So we, we want you, Lamar and Jim and Katie and the whole clan to have a beautiful holiday season. And I thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight. We will be back next week. Stay tuned for our uh, the announcement of our next special guest, but it will be next Sunday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also need to plug our uh, our shows, our virtual shows that we have going. Uh, the Judy Garland Christmas Show is going to open up next week on Saturday night. Um, so we have that coming up. Lamar has seen me as Judy, so she can testify. It's a pretty good show. You are wonderful. Thank you. So, and I love, I love when you and John are together, too. And that's the Golden Girls. We have the Golden Girls Christmas show opens next week virtually, too. Great right, sense of humor. I was so lucky to be part of the Collins Port Players. Aww. We were so lucky to have you with us. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight, guys. And I will see you all next week, I hope. Be sure to share Mac and Chat on Facebook. Like the page, share good reviews, subscribe to the YouTube channel, Mac and Chat on YouTube. And you can leave good reviews there uh, too. All right. Thank you so much and have a wonderful holiday season. I hope we see you next week. And Ms. H, don't hang up. We're just saying goodbye to our audience, but don't hang up. Good night, everybody. Bye.